Hello beautiful people, my name is Bridget and welcome back to my channel. Today is going to be episode 2 of my new series on my channel. I'm hoping to like get going and today is episode 2 of Makeup and Misfortune. Today we're talking about the life, career, tragedy, and death of Veronica Lake, a 1940s movie star known for her peekaboo hair who has an unfortunate story to tell and I think it's something that maybe a lot of us will be saddened by because it's not a great story but maybe you'll learn something from it. I think these videos are very nice for like educational purposes. You learn something about an old Hollywood star. I'm not just gonna do old Hollywood stars, but that's the first two episodes. Last episode was Jean Tierney, which I could not wait to tell you that story in case you didn't know it. But today we're talking about Veronica Lake. So Veronica Lake was known for her peekaboo hair in the 40s and she didn't stay in the spotlight a very long time. So some of you may not be familiar with her, but hopefully you'll learn something today. You can check out some of her movies. I will leave one or two things about her link down below you can check out um, if you're interested after the story and let's go ahead and get started really quickly though I do have a quick shout out for my small business theopencurve.com where my crescent moon earrings are from today and yeah okay let's get started all right so let's get started so Veronica Lake was actually born by the name Constance Francis Marie Ockelman it's like a whole lot of names, four names there, on November 14th, 1922 in Brooklyn, New York. If you were a call, you probably don't. It's cool. Our last story is about Jean Tierney, and she was also born in Brooklyn, New York. So when she was growing up, her mother also was by the name Constance. She stayed at home, and she was only 17 when she married Veronica's father. And then her father worked at an oil company on a boat. But when Veronica was only 10 in 1932, he died of an oil tanker explosion. And that was the first tragedy of her life is that her father died when she was just really young. However, her mother wanted the family to be taken care of. So the next year, 1933, Veronica's mother, also named Constance, remarried. And the family lived in New York until Veronica was sent away for school. She went to an all-girls Catholic school. And she was eventually, because of bad behavior, expelled from that school. And then later on, after her stepfather got sick, Veronica and her family moved to uh, Florida, Miami, Florida, and she went to high school there. It's also the same time that she was really getting recognized for being beautiful, and her mother really wanted a lot for Veronica because she was so beautiful. So she put her in beauty pageants. She did really well in those. And then the next thing that Veronica's mom saw in her sights was Hollywood. And remember, at this time, in the early 30s, Hollywood was a new thing. Movies had just started maybe 10 years ago, and in the 30s, we see the first ever, like, female stars that, are, like, really predominant. Like, in the late 20s, we saw more Jean Harlow-type people, and now in the 30s, with talking pictures, we're seeing more stars like Carol Lombard, who are just, like, oh, just beautiful stars with, like, a great stage presence. Now, before we get into Hollywood and everything, while Veronica was in Florida, she was diagnosed with schizophrenia, which her mother had her diagnosed is that Veronica was a really bad child. She had a lot of behavioral issues. Like we said, she got kicked out of Catholic school for behavioral issues, but honestly, Catholic school is probably easy to get kicked out of. <laughs> um, but yeah, she was diagnosed around high school age with schizophrenia. But after all the beauty pageants and her mother said that she needed to be an actress, the family moved to California and she began working as an actress. She started studying acting and her first couple roles were on stage. She met a girl who introduced her to plays and acting. She did two plays. Her first play was Thought for Food and she did a few small film scenes here and there as extras until 1941 when she got her new name. So. Constance was the name she was going by. It was her birth name until she became a star. An actor or a director she was working with said that while working a scene as a like nightclub singer, they said that her eyes were calm and clear like a blue lake. So she chose the name Lake as her surname for that. I'm, I'm not 100% I'm not sure where she got the name Veronica from, but maybe it just sounds fancy and older. A lot of the time she said she was young playing these roles, but she wanted to be 15 acting like 30, coming off as 30, but she always thought she came off as really young regardless of how old she tried to come off as. And while she was doing that nightclub singing gig in I Wanted Wings in 1941, that was her first like 
starring recognizable role on film. I haven't used this concealer before. I didn't realize it would be this light. Okay. <laughs> um, but around this time, around 1941, is the first time that Veronica accidentally comes up with her signature look, the peekaboo hair look, which what she is known for still. Like, that is the Veronica like signature is the hair. Now, later on in her life, she did say that like a lot of stars like Betty Grable were known as like cheesecake, you know? And cheesecake is like the pinup, sexy, long legs showing look. And she always thought <laughs> that her being labeled as a sex symbol was stupid and she was more of a sex zombie as the industry put her in different roles like that, um, which I think is pretty funny. But she got her signature peekaboo hair look going on. She accidentally discovered it when her hair fell in front of her face and it just become the most iconic thing. And she had to do that in every movie going forward because that's what the directors wanted. She had like this mysterious look about her, like this mysterious cheeky, like, hmm, look about her with the hair in front of the face, the peekaboo waves. Her hair had long blonde locks. They looked beautiful. And it had like this little bit of kind of like a really loose finger wave in the front that gave it that peekaboo look. And that was her signature. And that signature look, a lot of people try to replicate, but couldn't. And that was her signature thing. Now her having that peekaboo look landed her a lot more roles because it just had that look that everybody wanted. Now from 1940 to 1943, Veronica was on her first marriage. She ends up having four during her lifetime, but from 1940 to 1943, she was married to art director, John Delty, and she also had a child with him. So let's get into actual film roles now and what she's really known for besides the hair, because the hair is like her thing, but she wasn't a lot of movies with the hairstyle, which got her to fame. So, in 1941, she got her first like role, like starring role in a film that did really well. And this is Sullivan's Travels. Now she's in this movie with, I believe William Holden as well as Joel McCree, followed by two other films with Alan Ladd. Now the film critics and audience love seeing Veronica Lake and Alan Ladd together. They thought they looked beautiful as a couple. So they put them in two different films together. And then I Married a Witch with Frederick March came out and that's my favorite Veronica Lake movie. Not just because, you know, I'm kind of a witchy girl, but even before I had like the witchy style and everything, I just thought that movie was so cute. I enjoyed it a lot. As well as The Blue Dahlia, which comes out later. It's probably her like best critiqued film. I think it's 1946. I Married a Witch is my personal favorite Veronica Lake movie. Uh, Sullivan's Travel is the first one I ever saw her in and I thought she was cute. But I Married a Witch was really like, she was something special, you know? Not that she wasn't before, but that's like what I was like, ooh, <laughs> Veronica Lake. <laughs> now, during the filming of I Married a Witch with Frederick March, they did not get along, okay? Both Alan Ladd and Frederick March both said that like, they didn't get along very well. They didn't like her. She had a nickname of being called the bitch. Rude, yes. Uncalled for. Yes, but she was having a lot of issues getting along with co-stars. So during the filming, I Married a Witch, Frederick Marx has to pick her up for a scene. And she, along with the help of someone on the crew, decided to strap a 40 pound weight across her underneath of her dress. And that way that Frederick Marx would have to struggle more to pick her up and he would seem unfit or, you know, he would seem weak. So just to kind of spite Frederick March, she did that on the set of I Married a Witch, which I think is kind of funny and kind of mean at the same time. You know, like he was out here calling her a bitch, which is not okay. <laughs> and she was out here pulling pranks on him. Like they just didn't get along in general. Veronica's bad reputation, along with not getting along with co-stars, even started on her first like real film, Sullivan's Travels from 1941, because she failed to disclose to the director that she was six months pregnant at the time of filming. The director got so mad that he had to be physically restrained. And uh, that was the first time on set that she caused a lot of problems. Her co-stars didn't get along with her very well for multiple reasons. The director of I Married a Witch said the opposite, that she was lovely to work with. She just didn't know how good she was. But majority of the people who worked with her in the industry called her difficult. She had a bad reputation for drinking a lot on set. 
uh, maybe to deal with her mental health issues to kind of under, put them under control because she was again diagnosed with schizophrenia we don't know if that's why the drinking was but some people suspected that she also was like chronically late and uh, people just thought she was rude but you know her reputation on set was not great now during her rising fame 1941 1942 1943 she did a lot of publicity with world war ii going on so she went around touring doing things to help raise money for war bonds and i feel like that's a really nice thing a lot of stars did they really did a lot of publicity to raise the most money they could for war bonds and she also did a lot of work trying to get recognition for females working in factories or trying to get females to work in factories for the war efforts but also raising awareness for hair safety now she was known for the hair right but she raised a lot of awareness for women in factories to make sure that their hairstyle was safe so that your hair doesn't get caught in a machine and it rips your scalp off because it happened it it happened but she was trying to raise awareness to prevent that from happening by being known as the girl with the hair but also appreciates hair safety now in 1943 i would say the peak of her fame the peak of her stardom which really happened very quickly like we think 1941 was her first like actual starting role like starring role i mean in 1943 was the peak of her fame she was making forty five hundred dollars a week which in today's money i calculated is just under seventy eight thousand dollars a week that's a lot of money seventy eight thousand a week i mean like if i made that a year i'd be swimming in money you know <laughs> or if I, yeah if i made that a year i'd be swimming in cash now i was saying that she had like a bad reputation on set and eventually the public got to see a little bit of this during a war bond presentation in Boston, they said that Veronica Lake clipped her own wings during that. And a lot of people said she was talking very grim and morbidly during that event. So the newspaper were already spreading things saying that Veronica wasn't like picture perfect as they thought she was. And that already took a little bad look on her reputation towards the public when the film industry and all of her co-stars and directors had already had kind of a bad taste in their mouths from her. We don't know if this is just her personality, her behavior, or if it was her mental health doing this. In 1943, at the height of her fame, Veronica took a little bit of time off for personal reasons because she was on the set of a film and she tripped over an electrical cord for a light and that caused her to go into labor with her second child prematurely and that child was born premature and passed away a week later it was a son so she took a little bit of time off work for that and that was really hard on not only her marriage but her mental health obviously and she began to drink even more than usual so she began to drink more than usual because of this incident with her child which i think nobody can blame her for and then also that marriage started to deteriorate right away after that so within that year they were divorced as well now in 1944 she goes back to work and she has her first like movie flop she plays a nazi sympathizer spy not a good look but also just a movie role not something to blame her for but people didn't like her german accent and didn't like how the movie came out at all they just didn't like her performance didn't like the movie and it was her first like flop and it started to cause issues with paramount pictures that she was working with at the time and she also began to out like speak out against paramount pictures saying they put her in bad roles and they didn't care about her all kinds of things like that so they really just put a rift between paramount veronica there was kind of a little bit of divide there and then after her flop of the 1944 film they started to separate themselves she did a few other things with them and then she started working with other studios as well now during this time also when her first flop happened she changed her hairstyle she changed her iconic hairstyle now part of it was the government asking her to do this to again raise awareness for safety in factories for women however a lot of it also was her trying to change her thing like if she was just gonna get stuck in the blonde heroine positions anymore like film roles just the blonde heroin pretty girl she changed that to get more of a serious look so her hair was different she did start to lose fame after the hair changed like it took a big toll on her career when her hair changed so eventually she does go back to that in 1947 but it was noted that she tried to change the hair and people didn't want it you know like people wanted the veronica lake with a peekaboo haircut 
and the femme fatale roles. She did start to do other types of roles though. She wasn't just like the pretty girl in roles. She tried to do movies where there were comedies involved. She also did a lot of film noir things, which is where the Blue Dahlia come from, which is her most like acclaimed like performance as an actor. Now by 1951, her star has fallen a little bit. She's not the top tier name in the industry anymore. She was married to her third husband, Andre de Toth. They were married from 1944 to 1951, had two children during that time, and they were in such bad financial straits that the IRS seized their house and they filed for bankruptcy as well as divorce. She just left him after all of that. They said that the house seizure and everything put her in high financial strengths um, as well as mental problems along with that. And can you not blame her? I mean, getting your house seized seems pretty stressful, especially when you already have mental health problems. But she left her then third husband, Andre de Toth, at that time and also before her fourth child was born with Andre de Toth, her mother was suing her for child support because Veronica didn't spend a lot of time with her children and Veronica's mother, Constance, was taking care of them. Now, after Veronica and Andre split up, she leaves by herself and goes to New York where she drifts from hotel to cheap hotel, just getting arrested several times for disorderly conduct and public drunkenness. She was just not having a good time and she was losing cash rapidly. Now, after a while, she did find a job working and living in a all women's a hotel in New York, the Martha, the Martha Washington Hotel, and she was going under the fake name Connie de Toth. So she kept her third husband's last name there and then she took Constance and made it Connie, but she was working as a waitress and living in the hotel as well at that time. And a reporter found out about it and they claimed, oh, Veronica Lake broke, you know, broke living in New York, not doing well. Some fans even sent her money upon the news of this. She sent it back, said she wasn't broke. She was paying $190 a month in rent, which is like $1,600 today, a little over $1,600 today, which isn't chump change, but she wasn't in great financial standing, but she was getting by, but she didn't want anybody's sympathy. Now her being arrested for public drunkenness and disorderly conduct several times is well documented, but she was trying to get her life back together after a reporter found her working at the hotel and she saw this as a way for a comeback. She was getting attention, good or bad, she was getting attention and she decided to take a couple other roles to try to like revive her career after this like, oh, she's broke scandal happened. She did a small amount of TV work in the 1960s as well as trying to revive a career on stage again because she did start off doing plays and they did okay, like she was, making decent money, but she was trying to like really revitalize her career at this time. In 1969, she dropped her autobiography, Veronica, talking about her life, her failed marriages, her sex life affairs with certain celebrities in there. She also talked about her alcoholism and she also just, just described regretting not spending a lot of time with her children. Remember, she had four, one died a week old, and she had three surviving children, but she said she regrets not spending a lot of time with them. Also, fun fact, just to throw in, Veronica wanted to be a surgeon. You know, her mother really pushed her to be an actress, but she wanted to be a surgeon. She did lie and say she went to a college for a year to be a surgeon, she didn't do that. But she always said she didn't want to be in the spotlight too long. She didn't want to be, you know, past her due date on the spotlight. She wanted to stay, like, for a little while and then she really wanted to pursue medicine. She didn't do that, but I thought it was important to know that like she had big aspirations for herself and making a change in the world. In 1970, she was interviewed by reporter Sue Cameron who described Veronica as like a, <laughs> I hate, this is so mean, like it's really mean. She said she kind of looked like a damaged, someone's cleaning lady, like she was damaged goods. She didn't see her as like this, oh my gosh, this we're talking to this glamorous star who's revitalizing her career. She just said she looked way older than the 47 year old woman that she was. Like her alcoholism had clearly taken a toll on her physically, but she just said she looked way older than 47 and that she was really taken back by her appearance. However, the same year in 1970, she does find her fourth husband while in England working on play projects. She marries fourth husband Robert Carlton Morano, and he was a retired British naval officer. This marriage only lasts two years, but she didn't get married four times. So clearly she was attractive enough to pull these men, but like is pulling men hard 
Uh, like the reporter can say she looks bad for her age, but clearly someone's interested, you know? Now in June of 1973, she is coming back to the US. She had done some press for autobiography. It had been a few years since her autobiography dropped, but she was still doing press for it, trying to get those book sales as you do. And she went to Vermont. Now in Vermont, she goes to a local doctor saying their stomach hurts. She's having stomach pains. Now the doctor does an exam of her. She finds that she has cirrhosis and hepatitis of the liver, as well as some kidney issues and injuries that weren't apparently known at the first, you know, look. So she goes to treatment for those things, as well as an unknown renal failure they failed to catch at first as well. They mainly were focusing on her hepatitis of the liver at the time, but she also was in renal failure. So in 1973, July 7th, at the age of 50 years old, Veronica Lake dies of acute hepatitis and kidney injury. She was alone at the hospital when she passed. There was no one by her side, which is very sad, but she was honestly in good spirits right before her death. She had signed some autographs for nurses, which they found very kind of her, but there was no one by her side when she died, which I think is very sad. Now at this time, earlier we had said in the 60s that reporters had said she was broke, but that wasn't really the case. She was just getting by as everyone else does. By the time she passed in 1973, she was kind of broke. And so broke in fact that when she dies, her son can't afford to go get her. She, he can't afford to get the body. He has to take out a loan to go get the body and do the funeral services. So that sucks. So you have to take out a loan to see, get your parents' body and do the memorial service. That's not good. And then also her wishes were to have her cremations scattered along the Virgin Islands in the sea. Um, that doesn't happen. What happens is after the memorial service, her cremations stay in the funeral home for several years until her, eventually her friend, a ghost writer on her autobiography, pays the $200 to get her ashes and sends them to Miami, Florida and has them scattered over the ocean. She has three living children and four ex-husbands. None of the ex-husbands went to her memorial service funeral and none of her three children got her remains to scatter them where she wanted. Her ghostwriter, a friend from her book, after several years of her remains sitting in a funeral home, sends them to Florida, not even the destination that she wanted her remains spread and has her remains spread. Now you think that'd be the end of the story with the funeral arrangements, right? Wrong. Wrong. Because in 2004, some of her ashes are found in an antique store for sale in New York. Who is responsible for that? Like, okay, did the people that were sent her ashes to scatter over Miami actually scatter them or only scatter some of them? How did a part of her ashes end up in a New York antique store? I would love to know. But honestly, that's the summary of the story. There were several things that happened at the height of her fame to her that she writes about in her book that were really disgusting. They talk about a director on one of her first films flopping his peen out on a counter, like half chubbed up, just flashing her with it. Very disgusting. She also talks about directors and people in the industry really berating her and being mean to her, you know, driving her to a point where her mental break and crying on scene and other stars in the movie trying to tell her not to be seen crying. Uh, so yeah, she had a hard time. People said she was hard to work with, but also in her autobiography, they she kind of claims that they were just mean to her. So it, you could take it as whoever side you want to, but the ending of her life being alcoholic, sad, or by making fun of her for being broke to the point where she does eventually end up being broke. Her ashes being left in a funeral home for years until they end up in a freaking antique store in 2004. I mean, she died in 1973, right? You're gonna tell me all the way to 2004, they somehow traveled to an antique store? How did the antique store intake these ashes? How much were they charging? And did they try to seek an actual family member? Or was it like, old Hollywood ashes is a good thing to sell? I don't know. But yeah, that, that part always bothered me. And that's honestly the cremations ending up not where they're supposed to be, not scattered where they're supposed to be, and ending up in an antique store is one of the things that always stuck with me about Veronica Lake and always made me want to tell the story. But anyways, you guys, thank you so much for hanging out with me. Thank you so much for watching this episode. I appreciate it. We're on episode two of this series. What do we think? Do we like it? I mean, I'm 
into telling these stories. I think it'd be nice to venture away from old Hollywood stars, but I also know a lot about old Hollywood stars and it's something I enjoy. I just don't know like, does it appeal to like modern audiences? I'm not really sure, but you can let me know down below. Um, if you have any other suggestions or feedback on this series, I'd love to hear it. Um, I would love to know other stories that you want me to tell. Honestly, any comments, thumbs up, interaction are good for these videos. I put a lot of effort into them and I hope it pays off. So thank you guys so much. I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you in the next video. Have a lovely and safe day wherever you are. Okay, bye guys.